Well, our guest presenter today, as you all know, is Guy Wallace. Guy is a performance analyst and instructional architect and has been in the profession since 1979. So if you do the math, that's 40 years of experience talking. He has worked as an external consultant since 1982 and has served over 80 clients, including more than 45 Fortune 500 firms. His early influencers in the business include such thought leaders as Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Bob Major, and Joe Harless. Guy has been a longtime pioneer and supporter of ISPI, beginning in 1979 with the ISPI's predecessor organization, and then uh, continuing on from there with uh, various uh, activities such as a newsletter authorship, conference presentations, dozens of ISPI committees and participation on the ISPI board, including its president's role. Highly recognized by his peers, Guy was the recipient of ISPI's highest award in 2010 as an honorary life member. At the local level, uh, Guy co-founded the ISPI Chuck Charlotte chapter in uh, 2009 and served on its board and as president. Throughout his career, Guy has delivered a total of 94 presentations to both local chapters and ISPI conferences. And now he just keeps on sharing his expertise by joining us today as our guest presenter. Thank you very much, Guy, and welcome, and the microphone is all yours. Thank you, Grayley. Yes, this is my 116th uh, presentation to a professional organization since uh, 1982. I am a performance-based ISDer. Um, we're going to spend the next uh, 55 minutes or so focused on lesson mapping and the analysis data used in that. So the focus is on lesson mapping, but the data that we need comes out of my analysis approach. Some of that may be familiar to you and maybe a little bit different. Uh, a lesson here up front, a warning, uh, adopt what you can, adapt to the rest. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna have five different points where I'm gonna do Q and A. There's a big slide that'll come up and it'll say Q and A. And so uh, that's when I'll entertain the questions. I may defer some of those questions till later in the presentation, uh, my call, I think. Um, you can always contact me after today with any questions, comments, concerns by email, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Uh, I don't use Facebook for business. We're gonna start off with a few slides here as kind of an advanced organizer. Uh, we're going to talk about performance data. Let's see, I'm trying to get my slides to change. Hmm, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's not advancing on me. Let's see here, what do I do? Okay, there, all right. So we're gonna talk about uh, performance data and we're gonna talk about enabling knowledge and skills data. Um, the uh, 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 performance data is captured in what I call a performance model chart, something I uh, borrowed from uh, Gary Rumler. I learned this. They called it a performance table, Gilbert and Rumler back in the 70s. And when I entered the business in 79, uh, we used a performance table and that evolved to become this performance model. It captures performance data. We'll get into that in a little bit detail later. The second thing is there's a bunch of knowledge and skill data, what I call enabling knowledge and skills that enable that performance. We're going to talk about that in terms of how it feeds the lesson mapping. And there's the format for the lesson map on the right. Um, if you're looking at this on your phone, it's a, a very small print and I apologize for that. Um, I was mentored by Gary Rumler and the late Claude Lineberry 
uh, credited Gary Rummler with inventing the 0. 0.4 font size. And so, you know, I'm a creature of, uh, of my uh, <clears throat> mentors. Um, my methodology is all called PAC. That's not a big deal here. Uh, my PAC methodology has five different methodology sets, if you will. Over on the right, there's curriculum architecture design. Uh, in the one down there is MCD, modular curriculum development. That's the ADDIE equivalent. And when I don't need to build, a, a, use ADDIE kind of a model to build a traditional kinds of training uh, of any blend, um, I have an instructional activity development, and that's basically for developing things like job aids, performance support, whatever you want to call that stuff. There's a common analysis approach that feeds all three levels of those design, those three design levels. And I have a project planning uh, and management uh, set of tools and techniques uh, to manage those three types of instructional systems design projects. Um, so we're going to be focused on the middle one there, the ADDI level and the analysis data that feeds that. Again, curriculum architecture design produces performance-based training and development paths and uh, planning guides. Modular curriculum development produces modular-based training, which I call events. Um, and the instructional activity development, uh, various kinds of content, but uh, most likely performance support, job aids kinds of things. Um, there's a free book that I have in 1999, uh, I wrote this book. I had started it back way back in 1983. The cover design was by the late Gary Rumler, who didn't like my original cover and went to the trouble to create this cover. And so what can I do? I had to use it. We actually ran a contest in my business to uh, vote on which cover you like, guys or Gary's, and Gary's won. Um, in 2002, this won an ISPI award for uh, uh, instructional communications. So this book is available as a free PDF, it's available as a Kindle, it's available as a, uh, a paperback as well. Now a little background to the lesson map. I had a project with Illinois Bell back in 1990 and I wanted to use my facilitated group process that I'd been using in curriculum architecture design going back to 82. And in the facilitated group process I conduct both analysis and design using a team of master performers plus other subject matter experts that may not be master performers. I sometimes include supervisors in that team and sometimes novice performers. But I've been doing this with curriculum architecture and I'd probably done about 20 of those by the time 1990 came around. And I wanted to use the similar kind of methodology. I wanted to work on this instructional design project at kind of the ADDI level and I wanted to use teams of master performers and subject matter experts to do the analysis and then to do the design. And so I had to come up with a format to put on the flip chart easel as I facilitated the group and I elicited and captured their data. Um, first wrote about this back in 1993 in our company newsletter at the time. Um, the first format is this one here. And I want to kind of draw your attention to, there's kind of three columns in there. They're not defined, but it says lecture, it says demonstration, and it says exercise. Well, that was appropriate for that first project because it was instructor-led training, and but I, it wasn't robust to uh, be useful for any blend, any mode, any media. So I changed that, and the next one came up, and it's got these three columns of information, demonstration, and application, or what I call info, demo, and apo. Our focus in this presentation is on the lesson map. Again, we've got the two kinds of data, um, performance data and enabling knowledge and skills data. The performance model captures both, um, the, the, captures the outputs and tasks and it and does a gap analysis on the right hand side and that feeds this lesson map format the enabling knowledge and skills have a bunch of categories we'll cover that in a minute and it captures all the knowledge and skill items within that category this example is company policies and procedures and it shows where it links back to the performance again now stepping back here to the performance model at the top there's what I call areas of performance that segment the performance for analysis purposes. 
Now there's other terms for areas of performance. There's major duties, there's accomplishments, there's key results areas, lots of different names for these things. It's the chunking of the job, of the performance. And the goal in doing that is to minimize or eliminate overlaps and gaps. So you have a fairly clean look at um, what it is you're trying to analyze. Now in my world, I've been, I do things on bigger job sets, on the entire job. The curriculum architecture design is about that and a lot of the modular curriculum uh, development activities are about that. It's not for smaller tasks. So, but in an ADDIE level project, you might be taking one of those little boxes on that top uh, graphic and focusing in on that or just part of that. And there's a performance model chart for the first area performance below that uh, store manager uh, model. So if you will, there, there could be a whole bunch of pages for the first area performance and several pages for the second, et cetera. So you could end up, typically these things can have uh, approximately 20 pages of performance model charts to define an entire job. Um, and that could lead to the design of a series of courses, if you will, and resources. So the performance model charts capture outputs and the tasks that uh, associate with that output and then gaps and causes. And I hope that you can see that chart well enough here. Um, that's as big as it's gonna get in this presentation. But let me move on to, so on the, le on the left hand side of the performance model, that's the outputs and the key measures and then the key tasks, and then there's a set of role responsibilities there so we can get role clarity. Who does the first task? Who's involved in the second task? Either with a check mark, or you can use other coding to decide you know, who's really responsible for doing that, who reviews it, who approves it, et cetera. On the right-hand side is the gap analysis. So on one page, I've got both ideal performance and I've got the typical gaps. And the typical gaps are important for me because even if my client can't go fix those things, if we're really gonna do training and not performance improvement by other interventions, but we're going to train, say, new hires, well, we need to share with the new hires and teach them, one, how to avoid the typical performance gaps and causes, what are the barriers to performance, how do the master performers avoid them, and two, if they're unavoidable, what do you do? Master performers know that because they've been there and done that. And so that's the, the premise here is that we're using master performers because they can help us navigate the real world with all the barriers. Now, my clients might take the gap uh, and cause data and go in a parallel project to fix that, or I've had projects that were deferred and, and stopped until they could go fix some of the performance uh, issues and then develop the training for their people. Many ways into this. For the uh, now enabling knowledge and skills, um, I use 17 different categories so that I can elicit and systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills using the performance model as the basis. So I use these categories. The first one, if you can't read it, I'll read them, some of them to you, co uh, company policies, procedures, practices, and guidelines the internal rules. The second category, laws, regulation, codes, agreements, and contracts, external rules. There's industry standards that might be applicable, internal and external organizations, marketplace and product knowledge, process knowledge, records, reports, documents, and forms, materials and supplies, and the list goes on. So I use these systematically to say, if I understand what the performance are, is what the outputs and tasks are, and the typical performance issues, causes and gaps, what are the knowledge and skills. And so I use that to stimulate the thinking of my team of master performers and other subject matter experts, blah, 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 and elicit that. And so I create these uh, knowledge and skill matrices on the bottom left there, and I link it back to the various areas of performance. Again, it could we could be looking, linking them back to just one area of performance, not a bunch. Um, but anyway, so that's the data that we use. So the Data on the top now is the performance model and on the bottom is, is the knowledge and skill matrices. The performance data is used to assess existing training and development content or learning and development content or whatever you want to call it, but it's for reuse purposes. The shareholders have made prior investments in this content and we're trying to salvage it and use it either as is or after modification. 
And if we're going to use it after modification, then we're probably going to be creating a derivative of the first set of content. So we're going to have a parent set of content, and we might have derivatives, children of that. And so we're going to, it's part, then we're going to have to worry about managing that. And, uh, but we're trying to make the content authentic. So if we're, there's some content that was written for some other audience, and we need to change out the examples and the graphics and some of the language and create something that's more authentic for our current audience, then we need to do that. Salespeople don't want to read a bunch of things that were created for engineers if it's obvious in the content and vice versa. So we capture our assessments of existing training and development on a form. And because this can get voluminous and we can have a whole bunch of these, my last project, we, uh, we assessed over 100 different existing sets of content to see how well they fit the need. And then all of that goes into feeding the design. So we've looked at that analysis of performance, enabling knowledge and skills, and existing training assessments. And we take that data into a design process after getting the analysis data reviewed and approved by the project steering team or the client or however you might want to do that. And then we go into a design effort where we then create an event map of lessons. Similar to a map of the United States is a map of states. And a state map might be a map of counties, et cetera. So we start off with this event map of lessons, and then we use the lesson map to capture the next level of design, and we articulate that with information demonstration and applications. And then for each one of those instructional activities, because it's a lesson map of instructional activities, we have another form that captures the final level of detail that we would capture and document get that approved by the client, and then hand that off to whoever's gonna do the development. And this is their marching orders. We want this event of lessons, we want these lessons with these instructional activities, and here's some structure and definition for each one of those instructional activities. And most of the data that feeds these three levels of design comes right off of that analysis data that was generated in the prior phase. At least that's the way I do it. Okay, first Q and A out of five. Uh, how do we create? Uh, okay, so we're, I'm deferring that one, Steve. Thank you for that question. How do we uh, sure it's uh, not bloated? What, how do we screen it just to make sure we get? just what we need instead of everything under the sun on one of those knowledge and skill items? Yes, excellent question. But I'll be deferring it. Where does the task analysis and media selection come in? Well, the task analysis was done on the performance model. So if I understand what the outputs, then I can do the task analysis. Media selection comes in when we're doing the design. And that can come in because it's either predetermined by the client because that's how they want it. And we see you know, how much of that can we meet. Usually when I meet with project steering teams, I say, if you don't stop me, I'm gonna facilitate this design effort and we're gonna make everything that we can self-paced. And the other options are coached and the other option is group-paced training, but it's, that's less convenient for the learners and management and et cetera. But sometimes they want it done a certain way. Let's see, is there a guiding principle process that you give the client, especially on how to select accomplish? Yeah, so um, uh, that can go kind of deep, but basically I say, you know, if you, if you, I ask for your top performers, I usually say to the client, because I'm bold and I'll say this, I said, you give me top performers, I'll give you a top end product. You give me average performers, I'll give you an average project. You give me bottom of the barrel, I'll produce some garbage. What do you want to do? It's a business decision short-term pain for long-term gain. We're trying to leverage the expertise of your top performers and get everybody to be closer to them and their performance. And that's the approach to this. So I do negotiate that with them. And then I ask them, okay, so when the next person volunteers who they're gonna put in on these teams, 
you check out whether you know them or not, because the top people should be kind of renowned across the, your enterprise or your function. And if they're uh, sandbagging us, uh, call them on it. And everybody chuckles and, and hopefully it doesn't happen. <clears throat> it has happened. Um, looks a lot like knowledge management. Yeah, same kind of stuff here. Um, and um, you could have decided that how you're going to package the content uh, is conducive to putting into some sort of a knowledge management system. You could decide you're gonna make a lot of job aids and you're gonna have to park them in something that makes them easier to find for the people when they're going to do it. If you can't embed it in the workflow quite right. Can you post that quote on Twitter tonight? Which quote was that? You'll have to write that down and I'm going to go on here uh, in the concern about the garbage. Yeah. Oh, I think that's in the book. So that's in the book. It's already there. All right. Let me move on. My buttons aren't uh, cooperating quite. Hmm. All right. There you go. So, uh, so we've got the the performance analysis data feeds the lesson map, the enabling knowledge and skills data, and the existing training assessment data so that we can try to reuse stuff and salvage prior investments. Um, now, focusing on the performance analysis data again, that's the color code Q. And so I have this performance model and it identifies for each area of performance, the key outputs and their measures, the key tasks associated with that, the roles and responsibilities, that uh, uh, distinction and clarification, and the typical performance gaps and the probable gap causes. I just read that for you, those of you who can't read that. Um, and so I use that data to talk with people about first the lesson objectives. And I'll get into in a little bit later in the presentation exactly what the dialogue is. But so on the lesson map, where do the lesson objectives come from? They come from the performance model. We want people to be able to perform. Um, and so that's where that's our focus here. Now, you have to be do this in a kind of a Socratic approach at times to focus on performance rather than on knowing stuff. You gotta know this, you gotta know that, you gotta know this other thing. Well, I try to steer it to performance. So my learning objectives, my lesson objectives are performance-based learning objectives, what we used to call terminal objectives versus enabling objectives. But I don't wanna get into a debate about um, the language that we use because it's all over the map. The next thing I use the performance model for when I'm facilitating a group of people is to create and start and backward chain. I go from lesson objectives to, okay, what's the application exercise going to be? And I always put it at the bottom of the applications column. I start there and I say, oh, I can see them actually performing these tasks in an exercise and producing one of those outputs. We can either do real work or we can do a simulated work. And there's various levels of simulation and authenticity. And if it's, you know, cockpit with all sorts of lights buzzing and things like that, we may want to step into it. But I start a dialogue about that's what the final test will be. The final test is actually a practice exercise where we're actually going to do something that's very, very authentic. And if I got master performers in the room, they love it because they've seen training that doesn't even touch that kind of stuff. Um, and then I have a discussion with them about, well, maybe we need more than one practice exercise, practice with feedback and debriefing and all that good stuff. I say, maybe we need two uh, practice exercises or maybe we need three. Now in Guy's model, he says, well, you know, the first exercise is easy peasy. It's easy, it gives everybody confidence, it shows them how to go about doing it. The second exercise is what Guy would call darn difficult. And the third exercise, Guy labels that one as from Hades. It's hellacious. It's everything, the worst that it could be out there on the job. And now the master performers and everybody else on this team say, well, this is that performance, it doesn't ever get hellacious. So we don't need all that. Maybe we just need one exercise or two. And so that's a negotiation and we end and we land at some place where we define what are the exercises. And we're just roughing this out. And that's what I tell them. All the words are temporary. We'll go wordsmith this later. Let's not try to make this all neat and pretty from the first pass on that. Let's just say, here's our objectives. We think we need three exercises, according to my graphic that I have here. Then my next question for you on the uh, design team is that, 
do we need to provide a demonstration of that exercise, which is authentic, just like the real world performance? Do we need to show them one of these? We can do a video, somebody can stand up at the front of the room, can be on, on, on an e-learning module. Do we actually show them what we, what we want them to do and then have them go do it three times? And so the answer to that question is either yes or no. Sometimes a demonstration isn't needed. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Okay. And so that's the extent of using the performance analysis data in the lesson mapping. The next set of data that we go to work with is the knowledge and skill uh, analysis uh, data. And we use the knowledge and skill matrices where we've captured all this. We may have more than one page. A whole bunch of different categories have things. And we, I'm going to make this kind of simple here. But for example, maybe we've said uh, to do this performance, and I pose this as, all right, so to make the demonstration make sense, what do you got to know so that you understand what, what's going on in that demonstration? And then then it's going to lead to the application exercises. So there might be something like, oh, there's a policy or policies you've got to know. There might be some process or SOPs that you've got to know about. There may be a tool that you have to know about. And maybe there's an interpersonal skill. And that comes from the knowledge and skill data. And so what we've defined then as a group is that, okay, here's this information that somebody needs before they see the demonstration, which we would tell the learner, the performer, that here's a demonstration, you're gonna do exactly like this in these application exercises, so pay attention. And we may do a slow motion demonstration. We may do regular speed and say, hey, here's how it looks. Oh, it's too fast. Okay, so let's slow it down, stop and, and start and point out, you know, what's critical using AR or VR or something like that, or just regular video or a demonstration up at the front of the room, um, so that people have a sense of what they're going to be expected to do in these application exercises. Um, so that's, I can exhaust my um, knowledge and enabling knowledge and skills that way. And then I would look to, okay, so we've got some existing training that we said we can reuse either as is or after modification where, and we've got that captured on these forms. So we would process through these forms as a team and we would decide, oh, that second piece of information. Yeah, we got that one covered. All right, we just lift right out of that other course and plug it right in here. It's the same darn stuff. No sense reinventing any wheels. Let's just use that one. And on this demonstration, we might have something, but it's not quite what we need, but we're not starting from ground zero with nothing. We've got something. And maybe that helps with the first application exercise as well, but it's not sufficient to our needs. We as a design team would decide that. Um, so that's the set, that's the three sets of data and how they're used. One thing I wanna mention is that what I'm not showing on here is that before that first yellow block in the information column, there is an open. I open every lesson. I provide advanced organizers. I relate to the previous stuff that you've been learning. If this is not the first lesson, if there's, this is lesson number 12, then I'm gonna tie in some of the prior learnings, uh, establish what you already know because you've been in the job for a while or whatever that prior knowledge is that I, that I think I can safely assume. And then we go from there and then that's the flow. And at the end, there's a close that I'm not showing and it's where I'm going to do the final debriefing, tie this to what's coming uh, uh, in the next stream of learning, et cetera, et cetera. So I just didn't show those kinds of things, but it's the summary and the transition kind of stuff at the close. So next set of questions. Yeah, so one of the one of the criteria for the people is that they're going to have to be reasonable. They can't be, you know, people who will say something and not give and take with the group because this is a team process. Um, and I establish ground rules in the team process that, you know, if we if we can't agree, we're going to go with majority rules and we're going to document the minority uh, viewpoints 
and we're going to take that to the project steering team and we're going to say everybody agrees except for steve steve says this this project steering team what do you say and they can say well maybe steve's right or maybe they say he's wrong but that usually means we have people who are a little bit more cooperative about doing this but the goal is to get you know get it right so you got to have time for the dialogue and all of that um, backward chaining yeah that's what i use because i go from the out of the objectives and backward chain i go from the application exercises first the demonstrations next and then the information and i don't worry about the opens and close other than i explain it to the team that we'll have that kind of stuff and then they grumble about it's probably going to be too long and you're going to spend too much time on that and i go no i'm actually going to spend uh, i think two minutes on the open and three minutes on the close as i try to estimate the time for these kinds of things um it's the agile um well so this is an issue you can't always get a team formed sometimes they're just too busy and nobody perceives the value of doing this my last project i had to do uh, the traditional uh interviews and document reviews and i couldn't even do observations because it was 22 sales organizations across the country um and uh, that you know they weren't going to send me to go look at those kinds of things so that's sometimes an issue as to whether but but it's really all about the data so if i can't do this through a, a facilitated group process i have to go the traditional route and i've got to go get this data now what that means is then is that i've compiled this data i've had nobody doing quality assurance control like the team would have been doing when guy writes it down i challenge them i said you know if i write it down wrong you guys got to fix it so I'll deliberately write something down wrong so that they can have to fix it and then I'll prove to them that, yeah, I own the process, you own the content of the process. And that's what I tell them and I challenge them to do that. Um, standard times, let me defer that one, Dennis, um, because it, it really depends if it's a controversial brand new kind of stuff or if this is old hat stuff and everybody. So th that's something I talk with the project steering team about, about how long will this take to do this? So if they tell me, we think it's a bread box or, or a garage, double car garage, or it's an airplane hangar size project, um, then I can estimate for them how much time it might take because everybody's worried about how much time I'm taking master performers out of the field, out of their work to, to work on these things here. So we have a general sense of it going in. But uh, when I did that labor relations project, I told them that was going to end up being, we thought, a three-day course. Managers wanted it to be two days. It ended up being four days. And when they argued about the design, and I said, okay, so what are you going to take out of these lesson maps? What comes out? You tell me. And we'll take it out, and we'll go to pilot test it. Well, they couldn't figure out what to take out without hurting it. So they left it, and we did a four-day thing. And that's how it went for, I don't know, about 10 years. All right. So I'm, that's the end of the questions I'm going to look at right now. And I'm going to go to the next thing. And it greatly, if you know how to, to get me to, <laughs> there goes my slides. OK, so an application of this lesson mapping thing. So it was in, I think, 1993. I'd been doing lesson mapping for a few years at that point. And I, a client had me come from Chicago to New Jersey as a client I've been working with since 86. And he brought somebody else in the room and they wanted me to develop training for them. And so we had a kind of a preliminary discussion of what they thought it was and what they wanted and all that stuff. And then I just jumped up and I said, can I write on your whiteboard? And my client who knew me by then said, oh, sure, because he thought this might be fun. And so in the very first meeting about a client's request, that's the blue box up in the top right hand, I start asking these questions and I, actually drew out the lesson map um, and, and put in the objectives thing. And I said, so, so what are the learning objectives to the person who was making the request? And they told me what they thought people should learn. And you know, it's really, as we all know, it's, it's about what people should know. And so my second question, because I let people do that, Socratically, I'm gonna walk them down the primrose path here and I just have to avoid any hemlock. But so I wanna know what people, what the learning objective is from their standpoint write it down so they can see that I heard them and I write it down just as they tell me. I'm not going to question them or challenge them. I'm going to say, so if they need to know that, what is it they got to be able to do afterwards? So I move from the knowledge objectives to the performance objectives, 
kind of from the enabling objectives to the terminal objectives. And, and then we write that down on the form, on a flip chart or a whiteboard or whatever they got. Um, then I asked them about the application exercise. It's again, the backward chaining that was asked about. So I asked about, well, there, are we gonna need an application exercise or exercises? for practice with feedback to really build skills and confidence to ensure that it transfers back to the job. And we have that discussion and then we put in, oh yeah, we may need, you know, one, two or three of these things because Guy explains then, well, you know, exercise that we can have an easy peasy one. We can have the darn difficult one. We can have the one from Hades. And quite frankly, when I talk language like that, my response from clients is, yes, that's what we need. Now, <laughs> Normally, they hate the time it takes in that, but when they when you start talking about the easy and we're going to really deal with the, the really tough things, the toughest things that they're going to have to be expected to handle. Now, not every training program needs to take somebody to that level of, of mastery, if you will, or budding mastery, um, because nobody's going to have mastery coming out of a training course. Um, but but we had that discussion and they we either decide on one, two or three. And sorry, my graphic has three in here and it doesn't always go that way. Sometimes they don't even want an exercise when we talk about that. So then I asked them about whether it would be helpful or not for the learner to see the performance prior to the exercises. You know, like to have somebody do an exercise in front of them so they could see that, ah, that's what we want them to do. And so now they, they can go off and do it. And the answer again is either yes or no. And I put it on the chart after discussing with them. And then I asked them what information needs to be presented prior. And since Guy knows his 17 knowledge and skill categories I can say. Are there company policies and procedures you need to know about and comply with? Are there laws and regulations and codes you need to comply with? Industry standards, internal organizations that you have to utilize to get the job done, external organizations that you got to work with to get the job done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I asked them all those detailed questions. And it's truthfully at this point where the requester who didn't think we needed to do any analysis, we just ought to just drop right in and start developing stuff. They realize that they don't know the answers to these things and maybe we better go find out. That's been my experience. And so uh, if, if, we, if they knew some of this and we even blocked out things, well, there's some procedures guy, but uh, I don't know what they are and I don't know how much that would take. So what we put a holding block in there to say, okay, we're gonna have something on that. And I can even begin to now go to each one of these blocks, each one of these instructional activities and put a time estimate against each one. And I only do it in five minute increments because we're just guessing. And so we can say, well, that first one might be five minutes, the second one could be five minutes, the other one is maybe 20 minutes, the other one is 30 minutes, then a demonstration will show somebody how to actually do that. Oh, I don't know, guy, that might be 20 minutes. And then we talk about the exercises and I write down the numbers that they would agree to. And then I go back to the exercise and say, well, we got to tell them how to do the exercise and then they're going to do it. And then we're going to review what they produced and give them feedback. And then we're going to do some reflection on that. So that adds some time to each one of these exercises. And I talk them through that and put more time on it. And then we go and say, okay, this lesson might take X number of minutes, plus or minus 25% is what my little box up there on the right says, right under lesson map of instructional activities, estimated length, not the length for sure, but the estimated length, uh, up, and it says plus or minus 25% in that, so that everybody knows we're doing our best guessing here, but that's all it is, is a guess. We get that done, and then my final uh, questions are about, well, what content already exists? And they can tell us, we can talk about that, and we can mark it up and say, okay, so we're not starting from ground zero on everything, but some things we are. And then the kicker, what barriers exist to desire transfer back to the job? Is Guy the learner gonna go back to the job and the boss is gonna say, Guy, what are you doing? That's not how I learned to do it. Quit doing it that way. Do it the way I know how to manage it because I don't know how to manage this. Is that gonna happen? Or are my peers gonna stop me from doing it? or what other barriers, or you're, you're telling me to do something in an ideal sense, but the tools and the data is not out there for me to do that. What's gonna stop this from actually transferring back to the job? And then we have that discussion. All right, I'm going to the next slide. And it's the same visual, but up in the top right-hand corner, the blue box changed, and it now says you can also facilitate a team meeting, a combo analysis and design meeting. And I've done this. 
where they've just said, okay, uh, we've got to start here. But then guy goes and meets with their master performers and other subject matter experts and blah, blah, blah. And guy walks them through these questions. And we frame the lesson or lessons after and and so what gets tricky about this is what information needs to be presented prior to the demonstrations and the application exercises. And, it, and so the question for you, rhetorical question, I guess, is what tools have we covered that could guide in, uh, deriving this or these information that's needed prior to the demonstration? And the answer to that is these knowledge and skill categories and the um, enabling knowledge and skill matrices. Those are the tools that we can use to capture that. But I have done this in a meeting. I had the straw man model, if you will, that I did with the client, and then the client had me, they, get, they liked what they heard, and then I said, okay, we can do the design in a day and a half or two days, something like that, and they brought everybody together that needed to be brought together, um, and we cranked out the design. It's usually more than one lesson, but for our purposes here, I'm uh, doing this in one lesson. Um, so now what questions do you have? And I'm probably missing these questions here. So host, uh, break in here if I've missed a whole bunch of things here. I don't see any new questions. For all I know that uh, we've disconnected and I'm talking to myself over here. Um, no guy, you're right on track. Oh, all right, good. Okay. All right, so if there are uh, no questions about that, um, I'm gonna go to the next slide whenever it lets me do that. There, there it goes. goes. All there right, goes. so. Um, this is an exercise either for now or for later. So when I teach people, I've been teaching people, uh, I've taught uh, several hundred people at General Motors this methodology. Their internal ISD staff at General Motors University and, and people at Raytheon and General Physics and, um, and some of the other subcontractors in the local uh, Detroit market. Um, and when I teach them to do this, what I use as fodder for their exercises, I would ask them to start with one of their kid jobs. When you were, do, uh, what, so they can, you know, in, uh, uh, inquire of themselves and fill out this thing based on their very own job. So I would ask them to say, you know, take a job that you had maybe in high school, maybe in college. It's amazing how some people never got a job until after college, but, uh, and that's an issue for them uh, because they don't understand work. Um, but I asked them to focus on that and then I would have them uh, uh, interview each other, facilitate each other about each other's jo kid jobs. Um, and then I recommend, you know, before you go do this live with clients, uh, which is perhaps high risk, uh, you might wanna do this on your, uh, on your kids or your parents' jobs or your neighbor's jobs or your, uh, people in the other cubicles or whatever, but you've got to practice doing this and asking the questions and getting your questions down. Uh, in my book, there's a set of questions that you can ask, but as I told all the people that I've trained, those are my questions, you can't use them. You need to learn how to paraphrase those questions because if you only have my questions when you go into these situations here and it doesn't resonate with people and you, you need to know how to ask that question a couple of different ways. So it's really all about establishing the uh, um, learning objectives. Let's see here. All right, so you start with the lesson objectives, call them learning objectives, call them performance objectives, call them whatever you want, you know, adopt what you can, adapt the rest. Um, then you wanna talk about the application exercises, go right from the objectives of what people gotta know and what they gotta be able to do, and then go right to the practices of the doing, which requires the knowing and talk about the easy peasy or whatever words you want to use or the darn difficult or whatever you want to use or for from Hades. You can borrow that one from me. I'm fine with it. Um, and then talk about whether or not we need to have a demonstration. 
in order to help the learner to reduce their fear, the threat of doing practice with feedback, because ladies and gentlemen, that can be fearful for some people, depending on what it is we're teaching them, depending on what kind of prior knowledge or lack, total lack thereof of any prior knowledge about what we're teaching them, um, that can be scary. So have empathy for the uh, learner, please, uh, who is really a performer. Um, and then you can talk about what information and if you can, you know, print out the 17 knowledge and skill categories and there's definitions of all those categories in that book. And there's other stuff on my website. You can go look, look at all that stuff and again, adopt this, adapt this, whatever you want, need to do. Um, but so um, because we don't have a lot of time and if you're doing this, you're just going to generate a bunch of questions here and I'm not going to be able to get uh, to answer them here, but um, so at the end of this presentation, I give you my contact information and you can feel free to follow up with me on any questions you might have for this. But this is, this is the lesson mapping and these are the analysis questions and design questions that I ask in order to populate that lesson map of instructional activities. The instructional activities again are information, demonstration, an application. Um, I, I typically start off, you know, I always have the open and the close that's in there. Um, but sometimes, because I've had clients who've said, you know, these people are, they're all going to feel like they know this already. So, you know, that's, you know, I don't know how we're going to deal with that because they all think they don't need this training. Um, and I would said, oh, let's just start with an application exercise. We won't even open the lesson. We'll just, they'll walk, we'll start with, uh, let's do it. Here's your handouts, you're gonna do this exercise and do it. And we don't wanna necessarily do an easy peasy one with that because if they think they're all experts at this already, we're gonna pick something that's either darn difficult or from Hades. And we're going to put them through that and then we're going to debrief and then we're gonna reflect on it and decide what it is, what is it that we saw from each other that was good and we could borrow and, and, and steal and reuse ourselves and all those things. And where, where did we struggle with these kinds of things? Okay, let's go to the open, tell them what the objectives are, give them the advanced organizer, and then start giving them the information leading to a demonstration, leading to an application. Now in this format here also, I could have done the open, given two pieces of information, go on to a demonstration, and then built an application. Then I could give a couple more pieces of information and maybe have a demonstration or not, and then go to another application and then give some more information so I can layer my design that way and build up to tougher and tougher applications by giving them more and more information. Um, that's another approach to do that. And of course, I'm just showing you the process and all that, but there's a whole lot of different ways to, to do this. Uh, uh, or you could have taken the philosophy that actually the lessons themselves do that, not just the instructional activities. So I could have right. said lesson three starts and does that and then goes to four and five and it does the layering that way. Yes. Yep. Hey guys, this is a good time to look at Steve's question. Second from the bottom, about uh, tr turning training uh, opportunity into an op uh, one for um, performance improvement. All right, so my favorite technique is I learned from Joe Harless never to question when the client says, you know, uh, I, he, he said this in 1985 at a conference, the late Joe Harless. He said, and when your client asks you for some training, you should not say, are you sure it's a training problem? <laughs> he said it in a whiny voice like that. Um, and he, he would always say that you're supposed to say, yes, I can help you. And I can help you even more if you let me do a little analysis. And so that was his method for doing that. I embrace the assignment. I go conduct the analysis um, and I let the analysis data chips fall where they may. Um, when we do the gap analysis side of the performance model, uh, rarely it are the knowledge and skills the reason we have performance problems. Rarely is that the cause, it's knowledge. It's a deficiency in the environment I've changed Tom Gilbert's DE around a little bit for those of you who know that well. Um, so I've got deficiency of environment, deficiency of the individual's knowledge and skills, or deficiency in the individual's, individual's attributes and values. We're asking Guy to do strategic planning when he can, can't do abstract thinking. He can only do concrete thinking. We've got the wrong peg in the wrong hole, and Guy's got the wrong job. So sometimes we have selection issues, but I let the analysis data 
which is the voice of the master performers and the other subject matter experts and whoever else was in the room, not guys. And I reflect that and take that to the steering team. And I will say to them, you've got a whole bunch of DEs here, a whole bunch of barriers in the job. Your master performers are complaining about it. You've probably heard about their complaints before because you handpicked these people. So, but this is what they say. So we're either gonna have to train the, the new people how to navigate these barriers and do all this exception kind of stuff or you need to fix the environment. And I've had big projects stopped after the analysis phase because the client knew that they shouldn't go on developing training. They needed to go clean up their processes and the infrastructure and all, all of that stuff before they started and then they you know then they need training on the new processes with the new infrastructure tools materials equipment whatever um and so that's my favorite technique for taking a training request is just go through do the project planning on the front end do the analysis phase and let the data chips fall and so after most in when you if you look at my methodology in the book you'll see that i do gate review meetings with the project steering team at the end of each phase now i'm a consultant i'm brought in for big deal projects you, you don't always get the luxury of, of having the stakeholders come together to take a hard look at what you're doing and what you're saying but when you when i do this that's what happens is that they'll look at that data and they'll go yeah we need to fix that we need to fix this other thing too all right, we'll work in parallel. Guy, you carry on with the training stuff and, and we'll fix these other things here. And I said, okay, that's gonna impact the training stuff, right? Because when I talk about when the training, you know, addresses those two things, it's gonna be different in the future, right? And they go, yeah, that's right. I go, okay, so we'll have to do a workaround somehow. And so that's gonna be um, the uh, long pole, if you will, from a project management standpoint that I'm, I may not be able to estimate when I'm gonna get done because I don't know when you're gonna get done with those two things. And so they might, you know, so that's a whole negotiation then of how do you go forward. But I go from analysis to design then, um, knowing that maybe there's some things I need to hold off on until they get them fixed. Guy, can you take a look at Mike uh, Ruckus' question? So are there formal written tests for uh, for needing pre-existing knowledge? Yeah, you can build that in. That's a discussion with the clients. You know, that's a great idea and I love it, but most clients aren't, you know, they they don't have necessarily have the ability to do that. Nowadays, you, you know, there, there's more uh, um, technology available so they can do that stuff. But so the test for pre-existing knowledge, um, we usually handle that by, and I, what I would tell them is that, when I design the exercises, if there are people in the room who already know this cold, I can design the exercises in such a way that they can have a role helping to teach, helping to coach, helping to guide, um, and you know honor their in, their uh, prior knowledge and use them that way. So if it's e-learning, then yeah, you can test out of a lot of things. But if you're going to a classroom training kind of a thing, um, there may be no escape. And rather than have people you know get bored. I will put them to work. Um, that's been my approach. Uh, Roger Essen, let's see, when you do a learner analysis, systems analysis, organizational. So I so I do uh, four types of analysis. I've showed you three of them here. I do target audience analysis. I wanna know, you know, I segment them. I, I wanna understand their incoming knowledge and skills based on experience and education. And I need to know what can I safely generalize and what can't I? So are they all electric degreed electrical engineers? So we don't have to cover that AC DC electrical theory because they already know that. But there's gonna be other things where some of them will know this and some of them won't. So you can build a more modular front end and let people, and so I, one of the things I try to do is I try to push as much content to self-paced. And now we've got the internet and we've got e-learning and all that stuff. So I would push a lot of content to videos and audios and and uh, uh, you know e-learning content and things like that and let people test out there and get through it and then come to the keystone course where they're going we're going to spend most of our time practicing this kind of stuff um so th that's a bigger design issue beyond the, the lesson map but yeah i think you've got to do that and when you're doing your organizational analysis i don't really do the whole organization but i do the process analysis because one of the questions when you're doing analysis is that you know so what's the process and if the answer is you mean the tuesday process or the wednesday process because every day it's different here dude and so you know they don't have a process or they have one but nobody adheres to it and that's what's out of control and causing a problem 
So if training, if you're getting a training request for new hires, that's to be expected. If you're getting a training request to solve problems, that's to be suspected. And so you've got to start with that and then navigate those two kinds of uh, uh, starting points a little bit differently. Uh, how do I relate to my model to Kaufman's MAGA? Well, I believe in that, but if I'm just doing training, um, you know, we're not going to do anything nefarious and build training into that. But, you know, that's a good point here. So how are we serving society? How are we uh, dealing with the uh, uh, the children of the world today. Are we doing anything that's going to negatively impact them? We've got to watch out for that. So, um, but so anyway, uh, the gate reviews. Yeah, that's key. You know, to me, the key thing is getting the project steering team together. I have to talk clients into assembling a project steering team of all the stakeholders. And the rule for the stakeholders is who could come out of the woodwork later on and take exception to everything that we've done? Yeah, why don't we uh, involve them since day one? If we get them involved in day one, then they have a say in this, they handpick where we get our sources from and all of that good stuff. How do you take master performance to the next level? Uh, to me, that's more that's where you get into more informal, uh, informal learning, discovery learning, constructivist learning. Uh, you can take people off a learning curve to a certain point, and then after that, you just need to get out of their way and give them resources. We have a couple minutes left, according to my clock. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have what questions I've missed. <laughs> I don't think you've missed any. Um, the there was one at the bottom from Mike. I just wanted a clarification. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what people say when it's not performance based. And when you start working with people and you anchor your design with performance, people go, okay, this is different. Yeah. I'm in on this. I have clients who tell me, you know what, we won't get these people to ever come back again. And I tell them, we're going to go into development after this design here. Um, and, you, and, you know, my client tells me that you guys won't participate. And they go, hell with that. We're coming. Yeah. Now that we've invested and in, we've got something that we think is good. And this happens all the time. And I've predicted to the clients and they tell, call me a liar. And then they have to take it back later on because people want to have performance-based training, instruction, learning, whatever you want to call it. I call it training. I'm old school. Um, and when they see that, people get excited about that, and they want to be a part of that. Um, and I've never had any problem recruiting my master performers to be on the development teams. And so I kind of do a kind of a facilitated thing to kick off the development teams, and then they go do their thing, and they build the application exercises first, and then they build the demonstrations, and then they build the information. And to answer Steve's question, the screen for information is, do you really need that for the application exercise? And that's, you know, and if you've got master performers, they'll argue about that because they don't want a bunch of fluff in there. Now, subject matter experts will, but, you know, if you've got a, a small group of them, they don't all agree, and then they'll argue about that, and you've got to have, give them the space to argue about that and decide and skinny it down. Um, but, um, anyway, so the question is getting out of SMEs ways is, uh, point certification boards that keeps requiring people to take courses that are below their level. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's, there's systems where it's just the way it is. And if I'm building a training course, I can't fight that whole system. Um, that's another battle for another, uh, another battlefield for another day. Um, but yeah, so so the best that we can do here is to make sure that it's performance based, and we anchor the design and performance. We talk about the objectives being performance based. We start with the application exercises. We want them to be authentic. I tell clients we want to do real work. If we that's too problematic, then we'll do last week's real work that somebody already did. But give me that real work, and we're going to put it in this practice exercise, or. We have to simulate it because we don't want to do every step. We just want to do the key steps, then we'll do some sort of a simulation. But it's got to be based on authentic, real work, not somebody else's job, but the target audience's job. Too often, I think we uh, try to build content to serve too many different target audiences because the topics that we address all have face validity. They do not have performance validity. All right, so I think I've exhausted the yeah. time here. Guy, Guy, this has been fabulous. Um, um, your presentation has been <laughs> extremely frank and certainly not glossy. It's uh, it's obvious that you're very comfortable with your approach. Um, one of the things that 
stuck out as, as I was listening to the, the presentation was that a lot of what you do uh, certainly requires a lot of client management and coaching skills, negotiation uh, of the scope and scale, and almost intentionally crafting certain discussion issues. And you then you let the team find the resolve. And so there's a lot of skill in just uh, delivering the model. Exactly. This is, you know, um, this can't be your first rodeo, Um, but it does take a lot of those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, so when I've trained people to do these things, I have them co-do it with me so I can step in if need to be. Um, But but it's but I've taken people with no instructional design background as a test on my own consulting firm staff. And train them to do these kinds of things. There's a set of logic here, but if you say I understand my own process, and I've got to trust that I've got good content sources here. So I own the process, they own the content, and I've got to let them own the content, even if I think they're wrong. Um, yeah, and that's we'll, right. we'll clean it up at the, after the pilot session. That's wonderful. Well, thank you again, Guy. And uh, just anybody who's still uh, on um, sitting uh, in their benches there, the uh, want to remind you that the video and the, um, the PDF of the slide is available and we'll be uh, uh, contacting you in the not too distant future. Um, Guy has also uh, posted his website and he's offering the free PDF uh, as well, as he mentioned earlier. So check that out. And uh, I believe you're also presenting, Guy, at ISPI or, or not? No, I am not. I'm not attending the conference. I'm going off next week to get knee replacement surgery. Oh, that's done. right. <laughs> I didn't want to hobble around a big conference. Uh, no, don't blame you. Well, thank you again. And so I'm going to uh, to sign off and uh, close the session. And thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us. It's been great, great, great presentation, guy. Thank you, everyone. So how many people do we have in total? Uh, 20, 22 at the most. Uh-huh. All right. So that's, the, that's kind of like the average of, uh, uh-huh. you know, 60% <laughs> of, the, of registrants. Yeah. So, but the people who registered and paid their $10, they get to go look at the video afterwards, right? That's right. That's right. And they'll be contacted by us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so they will, you know, maybe they may be doing that just so they can see the video. Yeah. If they're not uh, chapter members. And, yeah. Uh, get it anyway. But um, the other thing is that another uh, another uh, thing to look at is how many people hung in through the whole presentation, and they all did. <laughs> so, so you are to be commended for that. Well, I had taken that screen and put it away to the side, so I never even looked at that one. I only looked at the uh, chat screen. Yeah, on, uh, good for you. But uh, anyway, um, all right. Well, uh, uh, thank you for uh, letting me have this opportunity. Uh, and uh, when you send out the uh, the handouts, I think that I understand that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, you can encourage people to um, reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions they have because it was uh, kind of a fast-paced thing, and I, I, you know, I couldn't tell if I got to all the questions or not because when oh, I went you over did. there, uh, I, you didn't, you didn't miss a single one. So the pace obviously was good, and uh, and um, I'm up here north of Toronto and in slow learner land, and I was able to keep up with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Grayley, so much. And, okay. Uh, thank you, Guy. Uh, good luck with the uh, with the rest of the programs for the chapter. Okay. Much appreciated. On behalf of the chapter, thanks again. You're welcome. Bye for now. All right. Bye-bye.